The Lord said it shall tarry, but wait for it. Welcome to the Power Blog site, Tuesday, September 30th, 2014. Maximum alert. There's literally a greater than 50% probability that the Dallas Ebola victim acquired his infection or her infection on the airplane they were taking out of Liberia. It means that the person in Dallas is a secondary victim, that there's still a patient zero out there who's actively shedding Ebola on that flight and subsequent flights, whatever they took. Now this information, the data comes directly from the Center for Disease Control's very own simulation model. And we'll show you, the uh, here's a chart from that model, we'll show you uh, detail here what this chart shows. Now basically it shows that the mean time to infection is 5.5 days. What that means is half of the people who get Ebola develop symptoms before five and a half days. The other half of people who get Ebola develop symptoms after five and a half days. So that's the 50 percent dividing line. And here's what that graph looks like. You can see there's a very few that stretch further on out, but the uh, majority here, even the most likely point, is five and a half days. So what does that mean? It means again, let's look at the chart here. We have this uh, this calendar that was put out uh, by the, uh, the New York Times. Big hat tip to the New York Times for presenting the data like this. And what it shows is a person boarded their flight on Friday and then within six days, this Wednesday, is when the symptom onset was. That means that they're within that 5.5 day period. Which just basically proves that there's greater than a 50 percent chance that the person in Dallas was infected on the flight. Now this is potentially catastrophic because there's a potential massive number of secondary victims who have no African travel history and are likely to not attract attention in any emergency room until after massive hemorrhaging has, has started. And there's no telling where this primary or this patient zero uh, potentially came from or has gone to. As far as we know, there are only two airlines that are still periodically flying out of Liberia. One is Royal Moroccan Airlines, and that could be very bad because patient zero might be heading off to uh, the Hajj. It could also be uh, a Belgian airline that's flying through. But uh, basically, anybody who's on that flight should be considered exposed. And anybody in between, there was a layover in Atlanta, it's just, it's just an extremely bad situation here. Potentially a massive number of people who have secondary infections that need to be tracked down who when they become ill will not attract attention because they don't fit the stereotype of a Western African Ebola victim. Be prepared. We will identify any context where we think there is a risk of transmission. At this point, there is zero risk of transmission on the flight. Uh, the the uh, illness of Ebola would not have gone on for 10 days before diagnosis. They, he was checked for fever before getting on the flight, and there's no reason to think that anyone on uh, the flight that he was on would be at risk. I want to end with just a bottom line before we stop. Ebola is a scary disease because of the severity of illness it causes, and we're really hoping for the recovery of this individual. At the same time, we're stopping it in its tracks in this country. We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control that stops the spread of Ebola and strong core public health functions that trace contacts, track contacts, isolate them if they have any symptoms and stop the, train of, the chain of transmission. We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control that stops the spread of Ebola and strong core public health functions that trace contacts, track contacts, isolate them if they have any symptoms and stop the, train of, the chain of transmission. We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control. We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control. We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control.
We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control that stops the spread of Ebola and strong core public health functions that trace contacts, track contacts, and strong core public health functions that trace contacts, track contacts, and strong core public health functions that trace contacts, track contacts, and strong core public health functions that trace contacts, track contacts. More and more school age kids are being equipped with radio frequency IDs and basically what's happening is uh, they're given these cards that have chips in it and uh, this way uh, administrators and educators can keep track of everything they're doing isolate them if they have any symptoms and stop the, train, the chain of transmission. We're stopping this in its tracks. It is August 6, 2014 on Wednesday. It's 8.12 p.m. Pacific Time. And up next, more on the Ebola virus. Dave Hodges, and this is the Common Sense Show. Monsanto, or Monsatan, as many call them, has partnered with the Department of Defense to use a proxy third-party company to develop a vaccine against Ebola. We can do that because of two things. Strong health care infection control that stops the spread of Ebola. Monsanto, or Monsatan as many call them, has partnered with the Department of Defense to use a proxy third-party company to develop a vaccine against Ebola. The seed money began at $1.5 million. The value of the deal could grow to an estimated $86 million. The company's name is Tecmira Pharmaceuticals Corporation, a leading developer of RNA interference therapeutics. Uh-oh. As breaking and shocking of a news story as this has the potential to be, the real story is that this is not the most important part of the Ebola threat which has invaded the U.S. The three most evil corporations in no particular order are Standard Oil, Goldman Sachs, and Monsanto. So has this announcement raised eyebrows? Of course it has. Everything Monsanto touches has a distinct trail of greed, corruption, and influence peddling. On last night's broadcast of the Common Sense Show, I hosted Joe Hagman of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Joe expressed the view that the real threat to our citizens may not come from the Ebola itself, but it likely would come from the resulting vaccine. In a mid-afternoon phone conversation I had with Joe Hagman, prior to the show, I asked him if he had heard about Monsanto being given control of the development of an Ebola vaccine with DOD seed money. Subsequently, the news director of my show, Annie DeRiso, discovered that this was the case and the information was less than 48 hours old. Will the threat be in the form of Ebola or will it come from the vaccine? Late last week, I reported the following. A desperate search is on to find the hundreds of passengers who flew on the same jets as Sawyer. In other words, patient zero. A total of 59 passengers and crew are estimated to have come into contact with Sawyer. An effort is being made to track each individual down. There is an inherent problem with this track down. Presumably, some of the passengers connected to other flights which known to be the case. Let's just say for the sake of an argument that only 20 people, a low estimate given the nature of the airports that Sawyer was traveling in, were connecting to other flights. The spread of the virus would quickly expand beyond any possibility of containment because in less than a half a day, nearly a half a million people would be potentially exposed. Within a matter of a couple of hours, Sawyer's infected fellow travelers would each have made contact with 200 other passengers and crew. Hours later, these flights would land and these people would go home to the friends, families, and co-workers across several continents. I believe that as many have reported in the past 48 hours, Ebola has broken any possibility of containment and has now been unleashed on every continent. 
Many of my medical sources are telling me that modern medicine really does not know what the potential is for Ebola to spread from a significant regionalized threat to a threat to become a global pandemic which would be as bad or worse than the 1918 Spanish flu. On last night's show, Joe Hagman expressed the opinion that perhaps the threat would be from the Ebola, but from the virus. Uh oh. However, I am aware of 100,000 West Africans that are coming into this country, primarily acting as drug couriers. These men come from the seven country region in West Africa, where the Ebola outbreak is raging out of control. And of course, as I have stated many times, this has led even prominent physicians, Dr. Jane Orient, to state that it is not a matter of if, but when Ebola is spread throughout America and the world. We put out a lot of carbon dioxide every year, uh, over 26 billion tons. Uh, for each American, it's about 20 tons. Uh, for people in poor countries, it's less than one ton. It's an average about five tons for everyone on the planet. And somehow we have to make changes that will bring that down to zero. It's been constantly going up. It's only various economic changes that have even flattened it at all. So we have to go from rapidly rising to falling and falling all the way to zero. This equation has four factors, a little bit of multiplication. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, that you want to get to zero. And that's going to be based on the number of people, the services each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out uh, per unit of energy. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that's back from high school algebra. But let's, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Hi, everybody. This is Lisa Haven, and I've got a major Ebola update, how it's engineered, being used as a bioweapon. Bill Gates is involved in scientists who claims they could use it to depopulate the Earth back in 2006, plus massive updates on deaths and people coming back to life and everything under the sun. Let's dive in. All right, let's start here. I have brought this up in the past and actually did an entire post on it, but I want to rebring it to your attention. There is a patent for Ebola, and you're looking at it right here. And in fact, it's not the only one. You can also view others here where it says four more. These are also other, you know, patents on Ebola. Here's another one. And let's check out some more. And another. And another. All right, these patents actually do exist. They are there, they have been created, they exist. Okay, that in mind, let's move on. And then there is this, U.S. Bioweapons Lab in Sierra Leone at the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak. Yes, 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 do you see this? Right where Ebola is breaking out, is a United States bioweapon lab, CDC lab. And guess who owns this bad boy? And I mean, this isn't a coincidence, folks. There's a reason this stuff is happening. But U.S. bioweapon lab that's in Sierra Leone with links to, you guessed it, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at the core of the Ebola epidemic. And I'm going to show you how these people are linked to this 
bioweapon lab in Sierra Leone. Let's first check this out. Now, here we are at the Biohemorrhagic Fever Consortium, and there's a link. I'm going to leave a link. Ken Kenham Government Hospital. Lovely. Uh, the Kenham Government Hospital, or KGH, is located 300 kilometers east of Freetown in Kenham, Eastern Providence, Sierra Leone, and had the highest incidence of Lasse fever in the world, um, and it is... Well, I'll just keep reading. This region is, is endemic to an array of tropical diseases, including malaria, yellow fever, TB, intestinal parasites, as well as Lasse fever, and now Ebola. <coughs> Despite enduring a bloody civil war for over a decade prior to its end in 2002, newfound peace has made its way to reestablish and expand the biomedical infrastructure and continue Lasse fever research in this region. In other words, they have a place that they're studying with the CDC, here's your CDC, a bioweapons lab. Maybe they don't claim to be doing Ebola, but I bet you money that they are now. And they're um, saying that they experiment with things like Lasse fever. But I beg the question that I'm sure it's other things in this bioweapon lab besides Lasse fever. Now, let's check out some of these doctors that are with this organization. And you're going to see direct links to people like George Soros and, guess, our lovely um, Bill and Melinda Gates. All right, here's our first one. Mr. Robinson, let's check you out, buddy. First they create it, and now they're going to let it loose. All right, so here's a little information on him. New Orleans. Hmm, Okay. Bio, um, James E. Robinson, MD, serves as a principal investigator on the research project investigating the roles of protective and pathogenic B cells in human Lasse fever, or Lasse fever, um, at least that's what they say. But I'm going to just skip because it's yada, 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 and here's what I want. Um... He, his is a collaborating investigator in four large consortia projects funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Why do they always have their names in things like vaccines and uh, things like Ebola? How come they keep showing up? Let's go on. All right, let's go to this woman. Harvard, yes. Go girl, Harvard. She deals with crazy stuff here, okay? Let me straighten this out. All right, let's find her part. Here we go, down here at the bottom. Paradise's awards and fellowships include the Rhodes Scholarship, the Soros Fellowship. That's the Soros Foundation, okay? So he's funding, he's funding her. I don't care if it's funding or what it is. These people have links. And anybody linked to him or linked to Bill and Melinda Gates is just not good. Now, this guy is also pretty cool. Wow, he is uh, Stephen Geyer. He's not particularly linked to Bill and Melinda Gates or Soros, but he is linked to a lot here in America. Let me straighten out his bio. Okay, there we go. Let's scroll down. All right, here it is. Stephen spent time at the CDC and prevention researching, you guessed it, vector-borne infectious disease, airborne disease, whatever. He studied them. He then moved to complete a master's of public health at Columbia University in a three-year fellowship with the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease. He has studied things such as Nile, West Nile, the Dungan fever, monkeypox, and Ebola. And he conducts an on-site training on biological techniques and laboratory staff in a developing world. So this man has links with the CDC and links with the U.S. Army. It's good that he knows what's going on with Ebola, but it is suspicious to me that they are right there in this epicenter. And this is pre-breakout. 
All right, then there's this. We, we know a while back that Mr. Gates donated lots and lots of money to combat the Ebola crisis. He paid $50 million to fight the viral outbreak in West Africa because he cares. Bull crap. Man don't care. He don't care at all. He specifically said... Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. We actually expected that people travel from West Africa some of them may become sick and present to hospitals in this country. Hospitals in their infection control capacities have been reviewing all their policies and procedures such that with all good hope we can take care of this patient safely and securely. Also, the public health people will be following up all those contacts of the individual once that person got sick because you see it's after they get sick that they're potentially hazardous to others. Now, were regular procedures followed because it took them four days to put this person in hospital in isolation? What are the risks of that? Well, we'll all be looking at those interactions to see what symptoms the patient had and what the medical response was at the time. And as I say, all the contacts of that individual will be ascertained They'll be followed up and put under close surveillance to see whether they will become ill. Now, what is the risk of a wider spread of this virus in the United States? We heard the CDC director say that he's very confident that they will prevent the wide spread of this uh, Ebola virus. But he didn't say we're confident that we can totally prevent the spread of the virus. Well, as I say, there may be some very limited spread around a case, but widespread I'm happy to say that will not happen I'm a hundred percent secure in that well as I say there may be some very limited spread around a case but widespread I'm happy to say that will not happen I'm a hundred percent secure in that well as I say there may be some very limited spread around a case but widespread I'm happy to say that will not happen. I'm 100% secure in that. Well, as I say, there may be some very limited spread around a case. But widespread, I'm happy to say that will not happen. I'm 100% secure in that. Now, tell us what precautions should people take? What should they look for? Well, the average person need only watch the television and read the newspapers to see what's happening. Well, the average person need only watch the television and read the newspapers to see what's happening. Well, the average person need only watch the television and read the newspapers to see what's happening. We in public health and infection control must stay alert such that if another person gets sick and it will happen from time to time 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 that when they go for medical care they're cared for quickly and safely that everyone uses the appropriate infection control precautions and those precautions are do not shake hands be aware that once a person has fever and is very sick, that's where he's shedding the virus. So we have to be very careful about bodily fluids, right? Is there anything else they need to, to do? Well, when such individuals present to the hospital, Berlitza, they must obviously say, I've been spending some time recently in West Africa. That will, of course, alert the caregivers. Also, caregivers now, 
in emergency rooms and other places are asking the question of everyone who has a fever. Have you traveled? And if so, where have you been? And one final question, Dr. Schaffner. We know that there's no treatment, but they've been trying some experimental treatments. Mm. How hopeful are you about that? Well, those, those experiments, those, those clinical trials are accelerating, and I hope maybe by the first of the year we'll have some product, either a vaccine or some treatment that can be tried in the field. That the real threat to our citizens may not come from the Ebola itself, but it likely would come from the resulting vaccine. And I hope maybe by the first of the year we'll have some product, either a vaccine or some treatment that can be tried in the field. It has to be studied. We don't want to give things that don't work or have bad side effects, of course. Dr. William Schaffner at Vanderbilt University Hospital, thank you so much. My pleasure, Rolita. The CDC has now come out and confirmed that the first domestic case of Ebola has been diagnosed in the United States of America. Now they're saying in Texas at the Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas a patient had came in and was put into strict isolation. They evaluated him for potential Ebola virus, EBD, based on his symptoms and his recent travel history as he came from Liberia. By Tuesday afternoon, the CDC received preliminary blood test results back confirming that the patient was struck with the deadly Ebola virus. So, they're stating he did indeed come from Liberia. He traveled from there to here. And this is the kicker, guys. This is a red alert. This is what I, I, I cannot stress this enough. Look how quickly they got this back and he was showing symptoms. Okay, this is an incubation period of 21 days. Let's not forget that. This man just came into the United States. He came in with symptoms, but they said they quarantined him. Now, he came in on a flight. Every single person that was on that flight manifest needs to be checked, tracked down, and if anyone's showing symptoms along those lines, they need to be quarantined, and anyone they've came in contact with needs to be tracked down in the same. This is what you did not want to see, but it's going to get out of control if they don't nip it in the bud quick. And like I said, they're reporting the first domestic case is here. How did it get here? Well, they stated he just came from Liberia. So I'm telling you, he came in contact with multiple other people. Not sure how he even got to the hospital, whether he was on a bus, took a cab, drove himself. If he has family members... All of the above need to be looked at immediately. As for right now, that's the situation. They're uh, stating, they're reminding North Texans who may have come in contact with the patient that this disease, while contagious, is spread through direct contact with bodily fluids. This is what they're pointing out. This is a lie, guys. You know it. You know it. We have shown you time and time again that this thing travels via the air. The cat's out of the bag. The World Health Organization admitted it. Um, the Canadian Health Ministry admitted it. All of these people have admitted it. This travels via aerosol through the air. And they're going to try to stop a mass panic here from breaking loose by stating a lie. And it's a deadly one. They're lying. People need to know the facts. At this point, I'm hoping people out there know the facts and know at least that you can't come into the same room as any of these people without putting yourself at risk. So that's the latest. As I hear of more, I'll keep you guys posted, but it's begun. Here in the United States, the first case of domestic Ebola found in Texas. Geneva Convention in at least four cases just on depleted uranium alone. And as uh, Mr. Duff pointed out, tactical nuclear weapons were used, at least one in Iraq, and several were used in Afghanistan in the Tora Bora Mountains, which actually mm. created an earthquake at the time. And you've got to look at the history. Um, Who's responsible? Well, in America, the ultimate commander-in-chief is the president. He has to give the final signatory to all weapons that are used, 
But historically, a lot of the chemical and biological warfare started off in Rhodesia. And, and when the uh, regime went from white to black, Maggie Thatcher panicked and decided to move the whole shebangle and the staff mm. all the way down to South Africa, where, where that uh, research and development was continued. They even developed a black-only bomb that targeted the Afro gene. And there's even talk now there may be one for the Chinese gene. You know, this is absolute insane.